because I kind of got ahead of myself here. Okay, so that's it, like in a nutshell, <laughs> the late Roman model in less than 10 minutes. So I hope you guys like that. The Byzantine Empire, this is where my primary specialty is. And I think it's the most unique because even though they were excellent at fighting, and they fought a broad range of people in every direction, what they were best at was they were using, they always used their mind. So they always used a different, a different tactic in order to approach a different enemy. And they had to, or else they would not be able to, as you can see, uh, to, to stay as they were in such good shape often most of the time, even though they are always teetering on the, on the verge of just a, a complete collapse for nearly a thousand years. As we talked about, it split into East and West after Diocletian, and we have East Rome, which is what we call the Byzantine Empire. And many consider it the most sophisticated army of the medieval world, in the medieval world for a variety of reasons. Most likely, I would suggest that if you want to do further reading on it, it's a little bit of a thick book, it's about 500 pages, but it is an amazing amazing introduction by uh, an incredible military strategist. This guy dissects things in a way that just opens your mind. And especially with uh, Byzantine histories, uh, this is probably one of the best uh, studies on the topic. And he also did one that kind of revolutionized Roman military history because he is an ancient historian. And it's simply just substitute Byzantine for Roman because he did on the Roman Empire for his dissertation. Just for some background information on Constantinople. It was just named after uh, the General Constantine. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with him. He was the guy who was on the Milvian Bridge. He supposedly had this vision of a cross in the air. And that's when he painted red crosses on his shield and won uh, a great victory, which obviously made him emperor eventually. This is why we have Christianity in the form of it as we do today, because before that point it was highly, highly persecuted. So it went from being kind of a sect into a, a world religion. And of course, we already talked about why we had the word Byzantine. It was a 17th century invention. The East Romans always considered themselves Romans. They never saw the, thought of, the, of themselves as anything other than Roman. They saw themselves as the, you know, the. <coughs> you know, a culture that, you know, had an ancient history and they were very proud of it. And that's also why the, their tactics and everything kind of held the same thing because even though they went to a primarily cavalry base, they never lost their infantry. So it was always an infantry uh, supplemented and augmented with a, a cavalry force. It was never predominantly cavalry. It was actually very, if you actually could see it in motion, it was almost like watching a, a dance. It was so fluid and they were praised by their contemporaries and later historians for just the way they would uh, proceed on, on ground. Okay, we're gonna look at two historians um, who had differing views on Byzantium, and especially about their military system. The first, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, just the name, Edward Gibbon. He wrote a massive eight volume study on the history of the decline of the Roman Empire. And this is what he had to say about the Byzantine military system. He said the vices of Byzantine armies were inherent and their victories accidental. The man I told you about earlier, the 21-year-old genius, was Charles Oman. He was the first modern historian to systematize the study of the art of war and synthesize his findings, all at the age of 21. And then he went on to write, I think, a five-volume study within a decade, which expanded on the same topic. And of course, he didn't agree with uh, Edward Gibbon's statement. So far as this sweeping condemnation from the truth that it would be far more correct to call their defeats accidental, their success is normal. I 
put these in, I've numbered these just in any particular order, and I put it in the order that I thought would um, kind of give you the biggest impression of Byzantine grant strategy. And they were highly courageous people. Uh, they were very homogeneous, unlike the proper Roman army. And in my opinion, I think there were a few people who faced such horrendous odds at any given time because of their location. I mean, they had people pushing from the north, they had people pushing from the south, they had people pushing from the east. And this is a little, little area. I mean, geographically, I mean, it's pretty much the center of Constantinople itself and the surrounding area. The rest was, you know, they had an empire. I mean, if you want to call it that. I mean, I'd use that term loosely. But as time went on, people just took chunks at it. I mean, they just whittled it down to where they were literally this by 1453. And it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing that they even lasted that long. Discipline, of course, goes with courage. And unlike any other military army, the Byzantine seamlessly integrated light and heavy infantry with great precision. The sheer amount of stress involved was enormous, and they held steadfast, even though often they were outnumbered. This is why they developed a grand strategy, so to speak, because they didn't have the manpower. They never did, even from the beginning. They went through several crises. There's a historian named Walter Kyge, who has a thesis about the 8th, 7th, 8th century crisis in Byzantium. And they were always loosely structured. They were politically fragmented at times. They had a lot of people who were trying to usurp power. So they had a lot of internal, you know, internal division. So even though just like their military was fantastic, the political structure oftentimes, you know, kept them only at a certain level. And they only had so many people to deal with. They only had so much money. So they could only do so much. So they invested as much time and training as possible into their men. And the third point, organization. This is coupled with discipline. Byzantine organization was exact and fluid. They were so sophisticated and advanced that they even fielded an ambulance corps and surgeons to treat wounded 110 yards behind enemy lines. For every soldier saved, the reward was a gold coin. And the fourth point was armament, as we talked about, because of their location and the various threats on all sides. Byzantines adapted, that's a key word, adapted to their enemies because every enemy had a different way of fighting. So if they didn't adapt, they just couldn't use the same same tactic in order to you know, treat every enemy the same. So it was the idea that military, military um, that fighting as a military unit was a science. It was something that would be experimental, so to speak. So if something didn't work, they'd go back to the drawing board and try something different. And of course, over centuries, they perfected it. One of the most interesting issues, uh, in my opinion, is the composite recurve bows that they used. These are the same bows that you kind of see Robin Hood using in the movies. Of course, he didn't use something like that. He used a, he used a long bow, a Welsh long bow. But when it comes to the Byzantines, they used something that they adapted from the step warriors. They're the ones who made this famous. So they also used a lot of the same tactics. They would fight these people. They'd say, well, if this didn't work, we'll, we'll fight on the, same, on the same plane as them. So if they use recurve bows, we're going to use recurve bows as well. And here's a picture of a recurve bow. What was the benefit? Excuse me? What was the benefit? It was swifter or more accurate? It's more accurate. It's extremely accurate in the hands of a, of a trained individual. And one of these step warriors, they could pick off a person running at a full gallop from 100 yards away. They were very precise with it. And they can do it with such speed and rapidity, it's, it's amazing. Here you can actually see it in, in motion. This is where you get its strength from. See how this curves? And of course, the fifth point, they had a complete system of tactics, as we talked about. And they used it as a science so that they could constantly be improved through experiment. Two of the best well-known tacticians were also two emperors, and you have Leo VI and Maurice. Leo was an emperor who wrote an excellent military manual called the Tactica, and its treatment on naval warfare is without rival in the medieval period. But it's interesting, he's also called Leo the Wise, Leo the Philosopher. So it's interesting that here, 
the wise, the philosopher, was writing a military treatise. And then Maurice was a general and emperor, unlike Leo. And he wrote what many consider the best treatise on war, and it's called the Strategicon. And it was used, again, it was used centuries after his writing. And if anybody's interested in, in reading any of these treatises, they actually have um, two new editions by George Dennis, who translated them, and they're fantastic. They are short, so don't have to worry about any 500 page behemoth in that. Okay, grand strategy explained. What methods were employed and why? The situation in the Byzantine Empire was problematic for a variety of reasons. For one, geography dictated that they were surrounded by hostile enemies. For another, they were plagued throughout centuries by internal dissension, threats to the emperor and competing claimants. The Varangians, they were quite, quite a sight. They actually have some excellent books on them if you're interested. All you have to do is type in Varangians and uh, or Varangians in, 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 uh, on Amazon.com and you'll find some interesting books on it. They were foreign mercenaries, but they were mostly of Viking heritage. I don't know if anybody's familiar with um, Harold Hardrada. He was a, there we go, I got a nod over there, okay. He was a Varangian for many years. Uh, won his fortune, won his fame, came back, and of course he was a prince before then and became, eventually became a king. But they were a dime a dozen of Sweden at the time. And eventually, they were a homogeneous unit as well, who for complete fidelity to the emperor, that's something you'll see often with the Varangians. And plus they walked around these massive axes. So they're pretty intimidating people. Nobody messed with them. So when the emperor had them around, it was fine. Their economic system, the military, no matter how good you are, if you don't have money to back you up, you're not getting paid on time. Your systems are kind of, kind of just, you know, come to shreds. So their, their economic system was often on the verge of collapse. Uh, in the last couple centuries, I mean, they actually developed a system, robbing Peter to pay Paul. They were paying in time because they couldn't give them money. Money was scarce. Uh, this goes back to the Carolingian times. I mean, they went from using gold in the Merovingian times to using silver in Carolingian times, and eventually it just became to the point where we're just gonna give you food. So we can't give you gold, we can food. And we're gonna give you a piece of land, you don't even know. So, that's a point that's actually very different in Byzantine, in the Byzantine Empire compared to the Roman or eventually feudal Europe, where you get into vassalage and feudalism. These people actually had claim to the land, and the Byzantine Empire they did not. And to make matters worse, they only had so many soldiers to fight, which goes back to the idea that they put a lot of emphasis on, on the training of these men. They weren't actually even able to fight for at least a year after the training. That's how much stock they put into training. Whereas in the Roman system, it could be as little as a couple weeks just to get in there. Here's the system I was telling you about because there was not much money to go around. So we have a thing called pronoia and pronares. I just wanted to pop that out there right now. We'll talk about it a little bit later. But this was done out of economic necessity and it was actually kind of just a genius. As we talked about with the Grangians, because they only had so many people to use, they, used, they relied very heavily on, on foreign mercenaries. So their homogeneity became less and less as time went on too. And at the fall of Constantinople, it's been argued by various people that they barely maybe had a couple thousand people, maybe, for the defense of Constantinople against the Turks. Some people even argue that it was even less, and that the majority of the people were mercenaries, and maybe you only had three or four hundred actual 